Most people, it's still morning here on the e on the West Coast, not on the East Coast. Here on the West Coast, it's about, I don't know, 11, 10 or so. Um, in this video, I'm going to talk about universal basic income. Now, I was going to title the video, like something about how to bring segregation back to America or something like that, because this is ultimately what it is. I mean, anytime that you ever have a situation in which that you draw a circle around a particular group, and then you give it a particular, you're going to cause segregation. That is, I mean, that's ultimately the definition of segregation, right? Draw a circle around a particular group of people and give them a particular. So when you hear the words universal basic income, it's really like, it's really being disingenuous, right? Because if you think about it, universal means that everybody would get it. Like not just a select group, not just a handful of possible people, not just, you know, a couple of, you know, individuals who are going to be tested to see if it works. It's everybody at once. That's universal. So when you have a situation in which that a few get a income to spend on whatever they want without any kind of like limitations to what it is that they need, just spend it on whatever you want. That is segregation. That is a segregated basic income, not a universal basic income. And I think it's really important for people to look at it that way because it is not the same as having everybody all the time getting that money channeled to them, which is something that universal basic income would be saying would do, right? So now we have this situation in which that all these people, including the NPR article that I leave down in the description, are you going off of this delusional idea that if we test UBI to see how well it works and then they give these people some money, right? Way beyond what it is that they're already earning. And then they ask them, did that help? No kidding, right? No, no kidding. What kind of answer do you think that's going to receive, right? Of course it helped. It's extra $500. It's an extra thousand dollars. Like, of course it helps. Right. I mean, that is like the lamest statement that I have ever heard asking somebody if an extra five hundred dollars helps. Right. I don't care how much money you make. Yeah, it helps. Right. So that's like it, it doesn't make sense when you go and test UBI on a handful of people, not the entire people, just a handful. And then you ask them that question. Did it help? Yeah, of course it will. Right. So now we have to think what is really taking place if you were to have a true universal basic income where everybody, regardless of how much income you would receive, would get money that you could spend on whatever you wanted. Okay, so now let's think about this idea for just a second. Let's pull it back just a little ways and think about it from an individual, you know, kind of kind of basics, right? Let's be let's let's be objective about this, right? So an individual who gets an extra five hundred dollars a month. Most likely, unless you are a very like, um, what should I say? Uh, you know, somebody who is very disciplined, let's put it that way, and says, no, I am not going to increase my standard of living. I am going to continue to function in a way that is just above poverty for my job. Right? And I'm going to take this extra income. And what am I going to do with it? Am I going to increase my standard of living? Or am I going to use this money to invest into the future? Now, most people will probably just spend it, right? I mean, you have to be a very disciplined person in order to take that money and go and invest it, right? So most people are going to take the beer side of the analogy when it comes to beers or saws, right? So those of you who follow me on this channel heard me talk about beers and saws. Like, where can you go with your money? You can either go into beer or you can go into saws, right? Beer is the... Per you know, the party, the consuming, the everything that has to go with into like the consumer idea of what this nation does. Saws are the production side, the manufacturing side, the producing side, right? So everybody's going to end up dumping their money into beer. Right? So now we have to think about this. Is that going to be a benefit to the individual? Well, it might ease the burden a little bit of feeling like you're in poverty or stuck or can't, you know, maybe advance in any way because you can't earn any money, it might make that feel a little bit better. However, if everybody is getting it at the exact same time, 
What that does is it increases the consumption for everybody out there. So you're not the only one who's now going to go out there and start buying beer or steaks or having a good time or whatever it is. Everybody else who got the $500 or $1,000, whatever, they're going to do the exact same thing. So now you have a certain amount of supply out there, goods and services, and then you have a, dem a demand. If you increase the demand, you have less supply. What happens to the prices? They move up. So giving UBI to everybody at the exact same time will then start forcing money into the economy from all channels at the exact same time. Decreasing the amount of supply and increasing the demand, causing prices to move up, right? Now, granted, there are people who are like, hey, well, then you can manufacture more and all this stuff. Yeah, yeah, great, you can, right? You can get the manufacturers, the producers, the people who serve out there to increase their supply in order to meet that extra demand, but the demand has to be there first in order for them to do that. So now we have a situation in which that we have increased the demand, but we didn't increase the supply. What's gonna happen to prices? It moves up, offsetting the whole point of UBI, right? So it actually creates a situation in which now, if you are receiving UBI and the prices have moved up, you are now forced into a situation in which that you need to vote for people who are going to either increase or decrease that UBI. Right? This is the point of being is that it takes your freedom away from you. Now, on the, off the political side of things, right? from what it comes to, because that's ultimately what it's gonna come down to is a political mindset, right? All these rich people should be paying the poor people, right? Something of that nature. Now, this book right here, all right? Cantillon's essay on economic theory. I left a link down in the description to the Amazon link, the affiliate link, so you can go and support the uneducated economists by buying this book, but it's free at the Mises Institute. Just type in Cantillon Essay on Economic Theory and you can find the free PDF file there at the Mises Institute. You don't have to actually purchase this book. I suggest put, purchasing it and having, having it for your own personal records because this book is so telling, so telling with economic theory. Now, there's three chapters in, in particular, right? The increase and decrease of money to the state and what happens when new money comes into, into circulation. It is very important to understand how it is that this new money comes into the system and what exactly happens with the separation between the rich and the poor. When new money comes into the system, you get a separation of the rich and the poor. If you thought the inequality was bad now, try having a constant stream of new money forced into the system consistently, all the time. Right? If you thought the inequality was bad before, it will grow incredibly worse. It will grow exponentially worse. Right? Because now if the new money comes into the system, what ends up happening is, is that it increases the consumption and increases the prices. And people don't want to pay higher prices for stuff, especially if they get new money coming in. And especially in the form of a UBI, because this UBI is supposed to bring things easier, not harder. And if prices move up, that's harder. Right? So what ends up happening is, is that you start increasing the amount of, of form production that comes in to, and it competes with the domestic manufacturers. The people who are actually looking for work will have a harder time because of the foreign production that is now moving back into the United States due to the fact that we have increased this consumption. Right. It's doing the exact opposite of what it is that people would hope for. Right? This idea of making your life easier is going to get more difficult as it starts to force the ever-increasing amounts of trade imbalance that happens here in this nation. Now. I'm under the, under the impression that this is probably the way that they are going to actually maintain the monetary system here in the United States. Considering we don't have that manufacturing base anymore, we need to figure out a way to produce a consumer. And that's really strange to think, isn't it? Like we don't manufacture stuff, we manufacture an actual consumer who buys stuff. Right? And if we're buying the production of the world, the world can then buy our debt. But we need to maintain the consumer here in the United States. And the only way that I believe that we could really do it, because the interest rates lowering and forcing people to take out loans to be the consumer, is coming to an end. Debt saturation is simply not going to allow people to continue to expand their debt in order to maintain the consumering 
that is the consumer the consumerism there we go that has taken place here in the united states that ubi will literally force money right into our pockets that will then cause the consumption to take place Right? And this is ultimately what the United States is going to need in order to continue on with their monetary policies. This is like some of the strangest things that you could ever possibly wrap your head around, but this is the truth of the matter. Right? And now, ultimately, if this new money continues to pour in and it continues to separate the rich from the poor, it makes the rich ever more richer. UBI does not level the playing field. It makes the problem worse. All right, so I'm gonna leave it at that. I mean, there's a lot more that we can discuss about this, that's for sure, especially when it comes to the Cantillon essay and talking about the increase and decrease of money to the state, how that drives that new, or that new money drives in the foreign production and drives out the domestic manufacturing. It makes a lot more sense when you start looking at it from that fashion as opposed to a political view of which we are trying to make our lives easier by handing out money to those less fortunate, right? That, idea right alone, although in the initiation of it, will probably do exactly what people are anticipating it to do, right? Made my life easier. I can now, you know, go to school. I can now start to save. I can do all these other things. Give us some time and all that will go away. And you will be right back in the same position that we have been. And But this time it's going to be even worse because now we'll have to vote for people who will either increase or decrease that UBI. That is a very dangerous position to be in. All right. Thank you all for being here. We have 198 people watching with 45 likes. All right. I'm going to cruise back up here to the top. Sage Monafo. I love the name. I don't know if I'm got it right, but all right. UE. All right. Dennis says, hello. Kevin, good afternoon from Lakeland, Florida. Good to see you, Kevin. All Nighter. Hello. Hello, everyone. Alpha Channel. Hello there. Got Kevin again. Sunday was my birthday. Well, happy birthday, Kevin. All right. Uh, Simon All Nighter, what's up? Anthony says that. All right, pooping while standing. I love the name. While UBI include reparations as well, I I couldn't tell you what the UBI because it doesn't exist yet. It's all theory, right? So what we will and will not do, who knows? Like who knows if it'll even be implemented? Just the idea of it alone, like if they had the credible threat that it was happening, then that in turn would start causing market reactions. You know, so. It's, it's hard to say what the actual limitations and what the technicalities of it all will be. I mean, it's all just theory right now. All right. Greetings, All Nighter and everyone. Hi, Simon. Hello. Lumber? Talk about lumber. Yeah, there's not much to talk about lumber right now. All right. Hey, hey, Sierra. All right. Hey, Sierra's up in here. Nice to see you. All right. Um, Millennial Mike says hi. All right, Mike. Good to see you. Homes and Hustles. Oh, that's right. That's right. That's Sierra's channel. Good to see you. All right. Uh, met Sierra at the uh, one rental at a time down in Vegas. UBI has been tried in other countries and failed miserably, much like gynocentric countries did to raise the birth rates. Yeah, I don't, I don't see, I mean, I don't know of any country that truly did a true universal basic income where everybody, including the ultra rich elite, got the same amount as the dude who was homeless on the street. I, I don't know of any country that did that, like, and on any kind of consistent fashion, like for, for years that would actually create the outcome in which that they were hoping for as opposed to the one that actually took place, right? I mean, I don't know of any nation that's really truly did that. Maybe I'm wrong, right? I know of a lot of nations that tried temporarily, did some staying. I mean, even here in the United States, we handed out tons of stimulus checks to people who really, you know, in, in all kinds of fashions. Now, I know a lot of people said that they didn't get their stimulus, but a lot of people did, right? And that was kind of the idea of like a universal basic income test theory. But again, it wasn't universal in the sense that every single person was able to get the exact same amount. That's universal, right? Anything else is going to be segregation. It's going to be limitations. It's going to be drawing a circle around a particular or a group of people and giving them a particular. That is not universal in any way that you look at it, you know, but yet they want to describe it as that which is very strange to me considering that it's a, literally it's a lie you know uh, yo you e what up buddy oh what a be buddy there it is uh logic of a reasonable person does not match the reality of the human experience yeah that's so true ubs uni basic service be much better free electricity heat water there's no such thing as free 
That's not, that's not true. There's no such thing as free, right? No matter what you think about it, you're, if you're thinking, oh, we'll tax the rich and then that will pay for all the rest of the stuff, guess what? I want to be rich someday. I don't want to be discouraged by getting there, right? So if I am going to be punished for becoming rich, then why would I try? To do that, why would I take my good ideas, my attempts, my you know ideas of manufacturing and services and business and all this other stuff just to be punished for doing it? Why would I do that? Why would I even try? Right? You have to be rewarded for your efforts, and that's what capitalism does. Right? It rewards you for your efforts, and I don't care what anybody has to say about it. There is no better system to bring best value, best products delivered the quickest and cheapest to the customer than capitalism. Anytime you ever incorporate government into it, they screw it up. Everything. Like how come stuff like medical gets more expensive but cell phones get cheaper right perfect example of it the moment that you put a middleman in between it all you are going to cause the prices to move up right you got a doctor you got a patient let's put a bunch of people in between it and see how cheap it gets right it doesn't make any sense you know and so yeah to me there is no better way now is it great hell no capitalism can also be defined as taking natural resources and turning it to garbage as quickly as possible Sure, you can look at it that way too, right? I mean, it's all up to you and the meaning you give it. All right, um, I did that. Took the first one, didn't take the second. My standards are there, foolish maybe, but money isn't the answer. Well, Scott, like if, to me, I took the, the stimul everything that I ever get that's beyond what it is that I need to survive, I invest, right? I mean, whether it's, you know, buying silver, buying stocks, buying, you know, into something, right? Making an extra house payment, something of that nature. I take that money and I do something with it and I make it useful. And I believe that the people who are, excuse me, fairly intelligent, not very, fairly intelligent with that money would do the exact same thing, which would boom, separate the rich from the poor again. Now you can go into, oh, well, we'll just tax it right back out of the rich again. That's discouraging me. I want to be rich. I want to be able to bring the good products and services and everything else that I have as far as my entrepreneur ideas go. But if I'm going to be punished for doing it, then why? I'll go find another place to do that with, right? I'll take my ideas and talents and efforts and go someplace that doesn't punish me for, be, for, for being successful. Right? Again, like UBI is a terrible idea for that. I don't, I, I honestly, like, believe that it's coming at regardless, right? Regardless of anything else, just simply to produce that consumer here in the United States so that we can keep this, you know, system functioning. But as far as a good thing and being like, you know, trying to try to, you know, lower the inequality, that's not going to happen. It's going to raise the inequality. It's going to make it worse. Yeah. All right. I need 5k a month UBI and all right. Do I have to go across the border to come back over to get free stuff? Okay. I'm not sure how people can see all the money that was pumped into the economy during COVID. What did it do to prices via inflation and to still want UBI is nuts to me. Well, Joshua, I mean, I could almost argue that one a little bit because I don't feel that all that money that was printed was the main reason that caused the prices to move up. If it was continuous like a UBI would be, then I would almost agree with you. But a shot of stimulus would cause prices to move up, but very temporarily it would be like a flash in the pan. The reason why we experienced the mass amounts of inflation that we have here in the United States was due to the severing of the supply chain. The breakdown of that supply chain, where you do not have supply coming in, but you have a demand up here that's going to cause the prices to become you know, outrageous, right? So long as that continues. But now that we have supply coming back in line with the demand, we're starting to see that the that the inflation scenario, the hyperinflation scenario that we were all anticipating that was going to absolutely destroy the United States and the dollar is not taking place, right? That is starting to come back down to normal. And although there's a lot of fear tactics out there and a lot of fear mongering videos talking about how inflation is going to flare back up and it's going to get out of control again, I don't find that to be the case in that fashion, like we could see inflation flare back up, but I think that's due to the fact that the manufacturing base around the world had come down. Man, that's going to leave less supply, like actual less supply, instead of just being locked up on ships outside of the ports of uh, L.A. or off the coast of, you know, 
the east coast or wherever the hell the you know the ships were locked up at you know i know there was a bunch off of la coast and i think there was a bunch down on the east coast as well as long as well as other places around the globe that severing of the supply chain keeping the supply from moving into the country moving into the shelves that kept that imbalance going which kept the prices moving now that that's starting to fade away, you can inject money into the system. Think about it. Quantitative easing one, two, three, and four failed to produce the inflation scenario that the Fed was looking for. A balance sheet increase from $850 billion to over $4.5 trillion failed to produce the inflation scenario. But now we're supposed to understand how all this money just all of a sudden creates an inflation scenario this time around. It didn't work like that. It wouldn't work. All right? It would create a short-term inflation. Right? as that money was spent through all channels, that immediate consumption that was happening, but then it would quickly fade away, right? And we would not have had that long lasting inflation like we experienced if it wasn't for the severing of the supply chain. This was done on purpose so that the Federal Reserve could get their ammunition back. Now, a great speech, and I love this one, right? Okay, today's, let's see, the, the face, okay, here we go. Today, today we face an altogether altogether different set of problems stemming from the very low neutral interest rate. That is a short-term real interest rate consistent with an economy operating at its potential alongside low and stable inflation. Ironically, the problem we need to solve these days is the risk of inflation that is persistently too low rather than too high. This was coming from the Federal Reserve's monetary policy strategies uh, given by John Williams, November 30th, 2018, right? They had a problem. Inflation expectation was persistently too low rather than too high. They solved that problem, right? They don't have that problem anymore. And people say, oh, the Federal Reserve screwed up. And they're like, no, our, the Federal Reserve's problem was that everybody didn't expect any kind of inflation, right? I mean, think about it. You know, even the, some of the last things that Donald Trump was saying, there's no inflation. The Fed should be printing money. I want to fire Jerome Powell because he doesn't know what the hell he's doing, even though he doesn't have any decision to make on, on the interest rate because it comes from the 12 voting members. If Donald Trump was truly wanting to have that scenario take place, then he wouldn't have been pointing the finger at Jerome Powell. He would have been pointing the finger at the entire FOMC. But it wasn't the truth. He didn't really care about lowering interest rates and printing money and doing all that. He wanted to lower the inflation expectation, and it totally worked. Right? When you lower the inflation ex inflation expectation, you can raise the real interest rates. That's what that's what Donald Trump was truly trying to do there towards the end of his administration. All right, I'm gonna go find the super chat real quick. Thank you so much. Hey, we got a uh, oh the member. All right, where's that super chat? It is. All right, Josh. Thank you so much for the 4.99. What do you think about silver's low price based on inflation adjusted prices? Is it being manipulated? Absolutely. Like there is, I mean, there is no more obvious commodity of manipulation than it is in the silver. I mean, they just straight up openly admit there's 150, like something like 150 paper ounces of silver for every one physical ounce of, of silver that exists. So you think about it, 150, 150 paper ounces. Like, what does that mean? Right? What is, what is a paper ounce? Right? A paper ounce is a derivative. It's like... Say I'm an investor who wants to invest in silver, but I don't want the actual physical product. Like, I don't want to take possession of silver and then have to go and sell the silver. I would much rather just fire up an app and buy silver on, you know, on, a, on, my, on my brokerage, my, you know, online broker. Well, you can't necessarily buy physical silver in that fashion, but you can buy what ETFs, like an exchange traded fund. So there's silver, like, let's make it simple. There's a silver vault right? There's a bunch of silver sitting in this vault. Now you got a company that says, hey, you want to buy into some of the silver that I have there? Well, you can buy this ETF, right? And this ETF is kind of a representation of the silver that I have here in this vault. And you can buy and sell this ETF like it's a stock, right? Well, think about that, right? That particular contract for silver that sits in a vault somewhere, think about 150 of those for every one ounce of silver that's sitting in the vault, right? All these 150 paper ounces of silver for everyone that's gone out there to the investment community, if they were to sell that paper and buy the physical, it would eat up the entire physical supply in a matter of minutes, right? And there would be nothing left for production. So this is really where like silver keeps its price suppressed is that they keep selling and investors keep buying into the paper, paper derivatives, 
right? If they were to get rid of that and move directly into physical, you would see the price of silver just absolutely skyrocket. It would be so damn expensive that nobody would even really be able to afford silver. And the only people who would be buying it, like physical, would be the people who absolutely needed it to build their products, right? Because it would just be so expensive. Those in the ultra rich, right? So that's that's why, like, in my opinion, silver is so cheap. They literally keep people just from even wanting to participate in it, right? And by continually having that incredibly heavy paper derivatives market, keeping it manipulated down like that, it really just discourages everybody from playing in the game in a, in a real fashion, right? Because, like, I think about it. I've had physical silver for a very long time, and there was maybe a few months in 2011 in which that I could have actually sold that silver off for a decent decent return. Right now, I don't even think I would make my money back on it, right? Like, I mean, literally, I don't think I can make my money back on the silver. However, I've had two stories in the past, right, where I used silver in a partial silver purchase of a car, right? So I literally traded 165 ounces of silver for a car, and then later I did half the payment with uh, with silver. I did like 40 ounces of silver plus the rest in cash to buy another car. So like to me, that's an insurance policy. And I look at it like that. I don't look to see where the price of silver is going to go. Like, you know, if it goes to from $25 to $50, you know, I might get a little excited about the $50 thinking that I might be able to get my money back out of some of it. But I'm probably not going to get excited about silver until it gets to like $500 an ounce. Once it's at $500, then I'll be very excited. I'll probably sell off my whole stash, right? Or at least a fairly a fairly decent amount of it. But as far as like hopeful or wishful or thinking that it's going to happen, uh, none of that stuff, right? As far as I'm concerned, the price suppression, keeping it low, is a benefit right load up load up as much as you can as often as you can and if it never ever does go up be thankful that you have something to hand off to your family right you know let you know as an inheritance or something of that fashion and that's the way i kind of feel about it like i literally don't care if silver goes up in price i would much rather stay low until i'm 80 years old and if it goes you know and if i make it to 80 and i still have it then i would like it to go to 500 dollars an ounce or a thousand dollars an ounce and all right thank you so much for uh for the for the uh super chat too i really appreciate the support i see we got another one down there let me go check that one out i don't know how long i can be out here for guys well let me see we got 11 40 i got at least another 15 minutes or so we can do this where's that other one at? oh there it is intrepid soul thank you so much for the five dollars ue can you explain what it takes to understand what you talk about for regular people, not reading Fed speeches. Can you explain what it takes? Um, wow, that's a, that's. I mean, ultimately, if if you if you're not gonna dive into it for yourself, like literally ask questions like, what's a mortgage-backed security? What's fractional reserve banking? What's um, credit default swaps? What is the bond market? Um, what is like, you know, if you can't ask those questions and then go and research it until you have absolutely internalized all that information, the only thing I could really suggest is to start back in my videos and watch all 1700 of them. And you'll, you'll be here in the same position I am in right now. Like literally everything that I've learned, I've, I mean, not literally everything, but the majority of the good information that I feel that I have acquired as far as economics go, I've learned in the last four or five years here. Like, and it's been on this channel, like trying to come up with the information, studying for, you know, coming up with videos, concepts, trying to learn it all that's how I did it. Like, I mean, start a YouTube channel, maybe, you know, like that's literally how you have to do it. You have to internalize and learn this stuff for yourself. I don't know of any, any other way, right? I mean, you can read the Cantillon essay, but it only gives you theories from two, 300 years ago, right? You got to incorporate these theories into today. Um, you know, you can study the bond market. That can be a lifelong mission just on its own, just trying to understand bonds, you know, and how they interact with, with the entire globe because really it's the bond market that is the heart of the economy and whether or not those bonds are going to be, you know, going to gonna 
be valuable? Are they going to get paid? Are they going to default? Like that, that question alone is huge. I mean, here's the situation. I was going to talk about this in a different video, but we can go ahead and cover it right now. In China right now, there's the second largest property developer, and I can't remember their name, um, but they are in a risk of default, right? But they came out with this announcement. See, well, okay, let me back it up here a little bit. This particular developer, right, this Chinese developer, they're facing the same situation that a lot of corporations are within China and a lot of corporations around the world, including the United States, right? It doesn't, this doesn't really, you know, this isn't isolated to one individual nation or anything. But what's happened is, is that making debt payments are very difficult, right? And everybody knows that, like even your own personal credit card payments and stuff like that, even if you have a decent income coming in, it's not the same, it may not be the same as what it was. And then all of a sudden now you got to pay, pay your debts, right? And this becomes very difficult and everybody around knows, right? Hey, this is difficult, right? It's difficult for you. It's difficult for everybody. So now they get concerned, right? The people, the investors are like, I hold the debt. I hold the bonds of this particular um, property developer, right? And now they are having issues in which that they may not pay these bonds. Now, I don't want to hold it if they default. Like you want to be out of that bond and just say, hey, man, I mean, I'll cut my losses now. Even if I have to sell for a loss, I'd rather take that than to take a major hit. Right? And so this is what ends up happening if the, if the narrative out there is like, you know, these people are in trouble. So what they did is they came out and said, oh, no, we're good. We made this huge public statement in which that we are definitely sitting in a position in which that we can pay these debts. Right. And then what happens to the debt value? Right. It starts to move up and the interest rates start to fall, just like anything else out there. When it comes to a bond, if the bond price moves up, the yields go down If the bond price goes down, the yields go up. Right. So now if you are in, in a corporation in which that you need to roll this old debt over into new debt, meaning you're going to sell some new debt, right, some new bonds that are coming out. But the bonds that you have already in existence are questionable on whether or not you're going to pay them. Well, what do you think the price of the new bonds is going to be? People are not going to be paying top dollar for it. They might pay you a, you know, a sale price or a depressed price for it, knowing that the risk that they would get from the yield would then offset that. Right? Okay, so now this is the way most people are in the feeling. They're looking at this corporation. They're looking at this property developer going, I don't know. You may not be making the payment, even though you did come out with this statement saying that you're going to do it, right? So now when it all comes down to it, this particular corporation is going to have trouble paying this bond because it's due in U.S. dollars, right? So how are you supposed to fund this? Like, how, where do you get the dollars from? And I mean, it was just like, this bond is due in dollars. These investors are not going to accept anything else but dollars for it. What does that do to the value of the dollar, the demand for the dollar? It starts to increase. This situation is happening around the globe. See, a lot of people were wondering, how come the dollar doesn't fail? It's because the demand for dollar outside of the United States is intense, right? And it's way more than what anybody would ever give it credit for. And the, you know, and property developers in China who get the best deal by taking out debts in dollars are then forced to come up with dollars to pay those debts back. Right? And so you wonder, like you look at places that are selling off U.S. treasuries, right? They say, oh, China's dumping treasuries. All these nations are dumping treasuries. Are they dumping treasuries or are they trying to get a hold of cash, right? Because the easiest way to get a hold of dollars is through the U.S. treasuries. The U.S. treasuries are the deepest, most liquid market in the entire world. So if you hold treasuries, you hold something that is almost as good as cash until you actually need the cash to pay the debt, right? So this is where a lot of like, you know, this is where we're, where we're sitting in, in for a lot of nations around the globe. This is the exact scenario that they may be facing in which that the dollar continues to strengthen through the quantitative tightening that is happening right now. And it's going to create that pain around the world. This is dollar. Like, I mean, I've said it before, dollar, the destroyer is coming to, to rule the world. Right. And now after that, like, yes, the BRICS nations and all these other people, they're setting up their funds and stuff. Long view, like the long view, the dollar will fail. Right. But that ain't happening tomorrow and it ain't going to happen next week or even next year. Right. It's going to be a much further down the road and it's going to take a very long time for the dollar to actually be dethroned. Once it does, it'll happen very quickly. Right. It will be over almost in a flash. But 
the process to get there is a very long road and it is not going to be just something that is going going to be this easily done by the BRICS nations or something. All right, I got another $5 from Javelin. Hey man, are Roth IRAs generally a good idea for the young family? Pros or cons in your opinions? Um, I'm a fan, especially if you're young, right? Roth IRAs, I think it's probably one of the greatest things that you could ever put your money towards because at the end of it, right, when you finally pull your money out, everything that's in there is tax-free, right? So this is like a wonderful concept for a young individual to get started with their retirement by getting into that Roth IRA. I am very much for that. Now, would I dump all my money into the Roth IRA? Probably not, but I'm a bit cautious in that fashion. However, if you feel fairly secure about your life and the, the way that you're going to be earning money throughout it, and you know you have somewhat confidence within the United States and the stock market that you know we wouldn't have this ultimate crash or anything, then I believe like having a bunch of money going into a Roth IRA is probably a really good deal, especially if you have like you know a decent income or stability for a, a decent income. You could just put like you know, 50, 100, $200 a month towards that for the rest of your life and pretty much forget about everything. You won't even have to pay attention to nothing, right? Just go do your work, put the $200 a month in there. From the time you're 18 to the time you retire, you're going to retire with a bunch of money. You're going to be super happy and you didn't have to stress about anything the entire time, right? That would be the pros. Cons, right? It's in the stock market. It's locked up. You can't get it out, right? And if you do, you're going to pay a heavy fee and you're going to pay taxes. You're going to do all this other stuff that ends up you know, creating a lesser for you than if you had just kept it, right? So if you are going into it for the long haul, cool. But if you are cautious, if you are worried about the government, if you're worried about the markets, if you're worried about the outcome of things, dangerous, right? Because it's locked up inside of there. So pros and cons to it. I think anytime you are young, youth is probably one of the greatest things that an investor could ever possibly have is being young, right? It is because you get to take the advantage of compounding interest, which is something that by the time you're 40, 50 years old, it doesn't really have the same impact as, if, as when you were 18, okay? So 18 years old, compounding interest investments of, of whatever it is, whether it's the 401k or something you're doing on your own, that's like, that is probably one of the greatest advantages you have is, is your youth, right? Is, like, I only, I wish I had the time, you know, because <laughs> I would go back and I would do it just like that. I would put money into an interest bearing account that has, you know, compounding interest to it. And I would totally go that route. All right, guys, what time is it here? We are 1150. Okay. I'm going to give it a few more. we got an early bird membership right on. Thank you, Kathy Weber, for joining the channel. You're going to be very happy with that. There's a bunch of member-only videos that you can go through. They're incredibly, incredibly informative, especially that last one, Understanding Quantitative Tightening. is probably one of the better videos that I think I've even done, but definitely one of the best member-only videos I've done. And although it's not like necessarily really entertaining, that Quantitative Tightening one was, in my opinion, it was because I'm really into this stuff, but it was just the information alone, like how the Federal Reserve announces that quantitative tightening has a huge impact within the economy, and they really discuss it pretty well inside of that speech. So if you haven't joined in the channel, consider it. It's a dollar a month, right? It's a buck to you, but it's everything to me, and I put a lot of work into those into those member-only channels. Um, yeah, so thank you. Uh, da -da. All right, silver 23, is that what it is right now? All right, uh, welcome Kathy. All right, we got another one, Javelin. Thank you so much for joining the channel. Yeah, like I said, you're gonna really enjoy those member-only videos. All right, you want a nice depreciating asset and a maxed out card for what's coming. You can avoid the high taxes and tell the bank to go F, them, F itself and still have a place to sleep. Yeah, you know, I, I, will never, I will never suggest to go that route. And simply because I'll tell you the story that I have and then I got to go because I got to go back to work. So here's the thing. I was in a very depressed state of mind, right? I was drinking a lot. I wasn't earning a lot of money and I was like not able to make my house payment. And I was basically going into default and foreclosure on my home. Right. 
And I just, I just lost it. I was like, I don't care. Like, I just don't care. If, a, if something came in the envelope, like in the mail or something from the back, I just threw it in the garbage. I didn't even open it. I didn't answer any phone calls. I didn't show up for court. I didn't do anything. Like literally pretended like it didn't happen. And that is probably one of the worst things that you could ever possibly do to yourself because it took me forever to recover from that, right? It took a long time. And talk about how difficult it is when you can't even get so much as a credit card. You are reliant upon your money and that's it, your savings and what it is you can earn. It is difficult. It is so hard to do, right? Now, I didn't declare bankruptcy. I didn't do any of that stuff. I had paid off all my debts. And Oregon is a non-recourse state, which is, again, something that you have to look into yourself or whatever state you live in. But ultimately, if I don't acknowledge any debt for seven years, then it just disappears, right? They just, they can't come after you for it or anything. And now that, again, it took that long and it was a hard seven years. And then you have to start recovering from there. So you have seven years to wait right before you can actually start building up anything like your credit or anything else that goes on so very 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 difficult i do not i i would if i could go back i would have done it differently put it that way i i wouldn't have done it the way i did it all right i see another super chat coming in from pm galleria thank you so much for the five dollars uh pm galleria does these great paintings this artwork and he incorporates silver into into the paintings he did this great great painting i have it hanging on my office wall well, actually my office corner because it's not really an office it's just the corner of the house but it's it's cool because it's got the dice it's got the mirror and it's actually got i believe a whole ounce of silver um, incorporated right into the painting itself so it's it's a really cool piece thank you very much for that and thank you very much for the five dollars uh the value of being young is recouping from blunders yeah it really is too lumberjack landlord thank you so much for the five dollars matthew man very cool of you if you haven't gotten a membership or missing out, the member-only lives are awesome and they're the best value on YouTube. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Matthew. Thank you for that. And it's true. Like, I mean, I just don't know anybody else who is going to put as much work and effort into bringing, like, breaking down the Fed's speech f literally for a dollar a month. Like, that's the only thing I'm asking for for the entire thing. And it's not even really to, like, you know, try and charge you for something. It's really just to bring the most, like, serious people to the table to have this discussion. And I'm not trying to, like, you know, deny anybody else out there from the ability to learn this stuff. But when we concentrate it down to just a handful of people who are truly serious about it, the discussion that we have that comes in the comment section about that particular topic really hashes out the, the good, the bad, the, the ideas that maybe somebody else didn't have going along with it. It is like good information and it's a great discussion too. Like I, it, it's actually turning out better than I had even thought it would, like way better than I thought it would. It's actually manifested into a better thing, you know? All right. What time is it? Oh, gosh, guys. Okay, I am going to have to go. I would love staying out here. We got 271 people watching with 131 likes and $24.99 in Super Chats. You guys are so awesome, so supportive of this channel. I really appreciate it. And I would also appreciate, before we end this live stream, if you go and hit that like button before we end this. We got 267 people watching. We get it up to 200 likes. It gets uploaded to YouTube. YouTube algorithm picks it up and starts sending it around for more people to join in on the uh, not only on the discussion for the for the upload after the video, but then they also get the information from it as well and UE benefits. So great insight as always. Thanks, Simon. Well, thank you so much. Crypto Beauty. I like the name. All right. Hey, can't see the membership button. Okay, that's it's no problem, man. If you go down into the description, it says join the channel or something like that. Or you can actually go to the page, my like my homepage of YouTube, and there should be a, a, a spot there. But down in the description, there should be a link to it. And then um, I believe if you go and you click on one of the members only videos, it shows how to how to join the channel there as well. But, all righty. Thanks, Simon and everyone. We really appreciate you. Well, thank you, All Nighter. And yes, thank you for saying that because we do really appreciate everybody who joins in on this channel. I mean, 
you know, like I said, I, I there's a lot of economic channels out there. There's a lot of people who discuss this macroeconomic scale, but most of the time you're going to find people who have any kind of level of understanding of of economics is usually guys who are like, you know, flying high, 30,000 feet in the air, man. They got their investments, they got the money, they got the real estate, they got all the stuff, right? They've done they done like, you know, figured it out and earned a bunch and they're describing some of the things that they are seeing and understanding from the economy, but they're not in our position. Right? Boots on the ground, working hard every day, you know, making sure that you have enough to buy that gallon of milk, right? This is the type of behavior that most people are are in, right? They they're not flying at 30,000 feet looking at the economy. We're showing up for work every day trying to figure out what it is that we need to do with our lives. And this is where this channel really breaks it down from that point of view, right? Much different from what a lot of other people are doing. And so when we break down the Fed speech, we're breaking it down and understanding it from the working class point of view. Again, when we look at like, you know, the Cantillon essay, and again, like if you haven't purchased this book, like, or if you don't own the Cantillon essay, I highly recommend you read this one, especially the three chapters on increase and decrease of money to a state. There's a link down in the description that you can purchase this through Amazon. I have an affiliate link, but you don't need to purchase the book. You can actually go and get that book, the, all, the entire essay for free at the Mises Institutes. Just type in Cantillon essay on economic theory. It should be probably one of the first websites that you will find. Like I said, there's a link down there. You can download the PDF and read the entire thing for free. I recommend having the book on hand, you know, because there's something different about actually reading it from the paper itself as opposed to reading the PDF. But I got to leave it at that, guys, because I got to go back to work. Thank you all for hitting that like button. Thank you so much for the support with the with the super chats. Thank you for being here. Thank you for joining the channel. Uneducated economist, you guys let me know.